so I can use less compression, say on a vocal. You can work your way through a vocal really quick with clip gain and make some dynamic moves that if you just throw a compressor on it, it crushes the crap out of the vocal. Mm -hmm. And I can say, well, this line right here is just going to kill a compressor. I can pull it back and it's still going to have the same dynamics that it originally had without it being killed by the compressor. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to meet with recording professionals, to hear their stories, and learn from their experience so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is John Yash, a.k.a. The Yash Man. He's a multi-Grammy and Dove-awarded mixer, engineer, and producer. He is well-known for his work in Nashville with gospel, country, Christian contemporary, and rock artists, and will sometimes have multiple songs on the top of the charts at the same time. His mixing credits have included Billy Ray Cyrus, Roberta Flack, Donna Summer, Winona Judd, John Michael Montgomery, and Collective Soul, to name just a few, but Yash got his start far north of Nashville in Detroit, Michigan, where he learned how to record and mix under the gurus of funk like Bootsy Collins, Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, and Zap. And it was through his work there with gospel great Fred Hammond of Commissioned and the legendary Thomas Whitfield that Yash ultimately made his connection to Nashville and then moved here to grow his career. I met Yash recently through our mutual friend Carl Tatz, who was also a guest on the show in episode 50 with the Phantom Focus System. Please welcome our funky guest, John Yash, to Recording Studio Rockstars. Yash, are you ready to rock, man? I'm ready, absolutely. Or are you ready to, to jam or funk? Oh, what for sure. What would you sure. say, groove? <laughs> I don't know. Groove. What did you guys say on sessions like that? Did you say, like, let's rock? or Oh, like on a rock? funk session? Yeah. Hit record, baby. <laughs> all right. Says. Well, you said baby. So that's <laughs> okay. cool. All right. We're all getting right. a little insight into that into that world. So, um, Yash, again, welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, man. It's really a pleasure to meet you, have you on the show. You know, as we shook hands, you're coming down the driveway here. Clearly, I could tell that I'd enjoy doing a recording session with you. You seem like a really laid back guy. Try to be. <laughs> I've done uh, my introduction of you. Can you fill in some of the gaps and tell us more about how you got started in recording? In fact, I've got kind of a a twist on on this question that I want to ask you. What did starting out in recording smell like to you? <laughs> like ganja. <laughs> like ganja. All right, there you go. I'm glad I asked, man. Um, no, uh, but just to step back before the funk era, growing up in Detroit, I had a lot of opportunity to listen to some great music because on the radio stations there, they played Motown and they, you know, of course, you had a vast rock music scene you know, that include, you know, Ted Nugent, the Amboy Dukes, and SRC, the MC5, uh, Bob Seger, hey. Oh, yeah, right. The underground stations, quote, you know, the underground stations played the early Zeppelin and Hendrix. And so we we were just inundated with great music in Detroit. And on a top 40 station, you could hear everything, you know, from Smokey Robinson to Hendrix, you know, and it was just an amazing time to grow up. In my teen years, I started a band, you know, 13, 14 years old, and did that until I was 23, 24. What's your instrument? A uh, guitar. Isn't Good every, choice. Isn't every engineer a guitar I, I player like or bass guitar, player? But, well, I mean, if you were the singer, then we'd know that you owned the PA. So. Oh, I was a singer, too. <laughs> you know, at 11 years old, I got the bug because I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and all I had was an accordion. I, I played accordion for four years. Nice, before dude. We had an the accordion Beatles. in my first rock band, and, and actually I owned one for a while here too. And I wish I would have continued being an accordionist because then I would have been a keyboard player, then a programmer, then I would have made a lot more money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so it was really hard writing Beatles songs on an accordion, <laughs> Beatle type songs. But I did write my first song on, on, an, on the accordion when I was 12 years old. After that, I had to switch to guitar. So then I had this band, and at one point when, when I was around maybe 18, 19 years old, we went into a studio. I was just fascinated with it. I always thought, if this doesn't work out, I want to do what those guys are doing because it looked like fun. 
And of course, I was so smart, you know, at 19 or whatever it was, that I would have panned that to the left instead of the right, you know. <laughs> I was I knew everything about recording. <laughs> oh, I'll just oh that guy doesn't know. You know, we could auto pan. We well, I didn't even know the word auto pan, but I we could, totally but remember I li- that feeling. But the thing was, you know, I, I listened to Zeppelin and everything, and I and I was sitting in the studio, and the guy just you know had a stagnant mix, which was really good because I've gone back and listened to it, and the guy was in a incredible recording engineer and the stuff really did sound good but you know when you're that age you just oh we could have done this and we could have done that well but the, but the reality was the music wasn't very good in the first place <laughs> <laughs> so after the band broke up in my 20s i started recording at home i bought a tx four track or tascam four track and a buddy of mine had a sony four track and we bounced tracks back and forth and we had a little studio in my basement the first home studio in Detroit, probably. We decided we were going to be songwriters and do song demos. I just learned how to record on my own, but I knew I wasn't really doing things right. At one point, I heard about the Recording Institute of America. It turns out, I didn't realize it, because one thing you have to know about Detroit, especially back then, I was a West Sider, and the, the studio was on the East Side. And I hadn't been there in like three or four years. I didn't even realize where I was going when I went to this Recording Institute of America uh, orientation. And I got to the studio and went, oh my gosh, this is where we recorded our demo four years ago. Of course, I, my memory wasn't very good for other reasons, but... Um, <laughs> for the things that smelled at, so good in the at studio. At the time. <laughs> but anyways, I went back to, to the studio and I was like amazed that I had actually recorded there, but they had changed everything in the four or five years that you know had been there since. The instructor was a, a guy named Bob Dennis who uh, worked for Motown. And he told us all, all, all about the classes that, that we were going to go through. And I I decided to take the class and learn something about recording. At the time, I was so interested in becoming a recording engineer that I started bugging the instructor. And actually, Bob Dennis was the ran the school, and there was another guy named Fred Munch who was the actual instructor for the beginners. After about two classes, I just started bothering him because he was also an engineer at the studio. I just said, "Can I come to a session? Can I come to a session?" sure, okay, we're doing this blues band tonight. Come to the session. And I was just in heaven. I came to the session and there was this group was actually called Chicago Pete. And these cats were unbelievable. Great blues stuff. I was hooked right then. And so then I just bothered him every day. Can I come to another session? And finally I made it through these classes and he told the uh, owner of the studio that you should hire this guy because he already knows what he's doing. So anyways, I got a gig at the studio. And which, what was the It studio? was called the the Disc LTD. It's on East Nine Mile, East Detroit, Michigan. And actually it still exists. And it basically looks the same as it did in 1978. Wow. Yeah, I, I went into it a, a couple of years ago and I couldn't believe it. It was still the same. The, one of the owners is kind of semi-retired, Bob Dennis, worked for Motown. And Greg Riley still operates the place. He was... He was the chief engineer when I started. He still runs the place. He also worked for Holland Dozier Holland. The funny thing about him is he's about the same age as me, but he had started out at like 16 or 17 working for Holland Dozier Holland after they broke away from Motown. It was pretty interesting learning from Um, these cats. Can you give us, maybe close your eyes and give us a visual walkthrough of arriving at that studio at that time and at that age? Like when you walked in... What did you see? What were the spaces in the room? Okay. What was the stuff you used? The interesting thing about this place, it was attached to a collision shop. Of course, it's in Detroit. It has to be, has to have something to do with autos, right? Cars. So you walked into this collision shop, actually almost attached to the building, and you walked into this lobby and the studio was upstairs. And so you climb these steps and I walked into this room. This is the first time I've ever seen a Ampex 24 track. Because when I recorded there four or five years before, they had an A track one inch. And here I walked in and there's this massive Ampex MM1000. And then next oh, nice. to it, there was a, a 16 track machine. I was just like blown away. And there was a, a 32 channel API console. I didn't even know what API console. I didn't even know how good an API console right. was. I had no idea. Just, just saw all the knobs, just like anybody else who walks into studio and they see that and they're taken aback. Because I had, at my house, I had a little tap go mixer and my four track and that's all I knew. <laughs> so I walked in, saw that and fell in love immediately and then walked out into the studio. And back then, 
it, this was truly amazing. It, it, at every studio, I, it, it turns out later I learned this, that they had a full array of instruments. They didn't just have drums and piano. They had drums, pianos, guitars. They had glockenspiels. They had vibraphones. Just a full array of percussion instruments. That's so know? much fun when you got all those toys to play with. Yeah, you, you'd see all this stuff and you go, I got to work here. This is So anyways, I took the classes and then I was fortunate enough to get a job there. Well, so, um, Yash, these are awesome. I love hearing all these stories. Can you share with us an inspirational quote? I like to ask our guests to, to give us something to get us kind of excited about recording in the well, studio. <laughs> it's funny. You actually said this earlier, I, but I wrote this down, and I, so I said it before you. Always think outside the box. Uh, I think that's the first thing. To keep fresh, you have to, you know, because you can get into a a situation for a period of time where, where you're mixing and recording the same things. And sometimes you just really got to take that and go, let's do something else. You know, let's see if we can do this and experiment with that. And the other inspirational thing is uh, just evolve and learn everything in the area of recording and mixing. Constantly learn. When I started, you know, I started with a four track and worked through the whole analog thing into the digital era. There was a point in probably around 1999, 2000, I was stagnant and Pro Tools was coming in and I wasn't quite wanting to learn it. And nobody else wanted to learn it either, except for the young people, probably like you, because you're so yeah. young. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, I had this wake up call. I'd recorded this project for some Danish singer. The, the producer really didn't know what he was doing, and they had me produce the vocals and then mix it and everything because this guy didn't really didn't come, didn't even think of himself as a producer. He was just trying to help this guy make a record. Anyways, Barry Beckett heard the stuff, and they wanted a, a real producer to produce his next set of songs. And I had done like three or four, and so Barry took me out to breakfast, and he started talking about the project. He's, you know, he said, how did you get him to sing like he sings? And I said, I, I just worked really hard with him. I said, you'll be able to do it. And he goes, well, do you use Pro Tools? And I said, no, I haven't learned it yet. Uh, I've, I've used it as a tape machine a couple of times. And he goes, hmm. He goes, well, I've really gotten used to it in the last six months. And I have my guy. And I think that maybe this just isn't, isn't going to work out if you don't know how to use Pro Tools. And I'm like, what the? <laughs> and of course. So immediately after that, it was the wake up call. Yeah. And I learned Pro Tools from actually uh, from a guy named John Lowry. He was a keyboard player in Petra, a Christian rock band. And he had been delving into it for years when they had the uh, original eight channel, you know, set up. Yeah. We actually started working on a project and it was just thrown in my face. And I said, I'm learning this no matter what. And, it, you know, it was, it was a, a learning curve. I was already um, 45 years old wow, yeah. or so, you know. And so, I, you know, I've noticed that when new stuff comes along, I dabble in a lot of different DAWs. I feel this desire to know and learn everything, which is kind of not possible in mm -hmm. a way. Right. Um, and the times where I've figured something out and really done well at it are times when I've just jumped in. It's like, okay, I got to use it now. I actually have to do something with it, not just like. Right. You, you have to do something with it. Right, you know? You're right, exactly. So I saw it work, and it was like, oh, that's for other people. But once I was thrown into the fire, like John and I, just we, we were co-producing a project, and it was like, he has two systems. I've got to learn one of them because he needs to be doing this, and I need to be doing these vocals over here, and he needs to be cutting guitars over here. We had two rooms. And I'll tell you what, the most fascinating thing for me and the best part about Pro Tools back then was when I realized I couldn't erase anything. Because up until that point, for 20 years, you were a nervous wreck about erasing every time you punched something in. And when I realized I couldn't erase anything, I could just undo, I was in heaven. <laughs> I used to have nightmares about punching in. Because I, when I would record Parliament Funkadelic, we did vocals all night long and guitar overdubs. And, and you were just punching constantly and worrying that you were going to erase something and you didn't want to erase anything. So... <laughs> I used to have night. I would go through the night, but like I couldn't even sleep because I'd wake up punching in. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and anyways, uh, all that to say, 
once I figured out that I couldn't erase anything, I was a very happy man. So did it turn out that not erasing anything is the heaven that you thought it was, or did it turn out to be hell in disguise? You know, I mean, there's well, mixed opinions on that. For me as an engineer, it was heaven, but obviously it has been uh, misused and there are way too many tracks. Right, being, for the producer. Abused, for it may the producers not be to have heavenly. so many different options. There's absolutely no reason to have 190 tracks, you know, uh, or playlists on one vocal. Well, and, so- and you see that sometimes. Yeah, indeed. I've done that. I've comped 150 vocal takes before together. And it was one of these things where I figured out a system to do it. And by the time it was done, I don't think that it was necessarily very good. Sure. (laughs) You know, I I don't do vocals very often anymore. When I do it with people, there may be a, a lot of playlists, but we're building the track as we go. And those other playlists are usually only there if we realize later that we don't have what we need. The top playlist is the master comp usually. Although I've done country music where you can have singers, they'll come in and they'll know the song perfectly and they can run it down four or five times. But in gospel music and R&B, usually you work a song, you work the verse or a few lines in a verse. And once you get that, that's the vocal, that's the take. You know, if you get that line and work your way through, and if you do it four or five times, you might have all these playlists, but you're not even thinking about those playlists anymore. You're just thinking about what's on the top. That's the take right there. And then just work it till you get to the end of the song and you've got a song and you're done. You go out the door and you have a song. Well, so I think you bring up an interesting point um, when you talk about comps and top playlists. It's one of the things that I discovered making records in Pro Tools. And, you know, it would have been true in any DAW, which is sometimes you work on stuff, especially if you're working for a long time, you're working on stuff and then you're putting a comp on the top and then you might have to go back into it and and look for something else. And there's a lot of organizational stuff that you need to keep straight to not screw up. And there were times where we'd come back later and it was like, wait, was that the comp? You know, the band's looking at me, the artists or whatever. And I'm like, well, it was, I think it was. Let me go look again. Do you have a system that has worked really well for you to stay organized with your playlist so that you know always at a glance whether all the tracks you're looking at are the ones that are supposed to be on top? Well, in the situation you just said, if if it was later on, I would probably not have just duplicated the playlist, but duplicated the track. And I would know that that was the track. And then I'd still have another track, even if it was hidden with all the different playlists. And then I would be certain that that was the the master comp. Interesting. So the master comp is sort of extracted from the track that has all the playlists. It's got its own. Just actually duplicate the whole track. And then I know that's the one. And then I still have the other one hidden. And then it has all the playlists underneath it. As far as all the other organizational things in Pro Pro Tools, that's why I have a really great second engineer (laughs) (laughs) who keeps track of everything for me. That's when you're actually doing the vocal. I, you know, I try to keep, track of everything, obviously, when I'm doing it. Do you use a labeling or naming system? Do you call it comp or something like that? Yeah, I would just call it comp, you know. So one of the things that I got in the habit of doing... But but also remember, I don't don't track a lot at all anymore. Right, fair enough, fair enough. uh, There are so many other engineers who do it way better than I do it. Right, so, okay, fair enough. So let's, we can stay more on the mixing topics. Um, but rock stars, I, so I refer to our listeners as the I know rock that, stars. I know that. And so, uh, rock stars, I um, I want to uh, give you this tip. There's something that I do when I'm tracking is I'll do multiple playlists, and then when I do the comp, I put that on the same name, and then I just put a capital C after the name of the the track, so that becomes the comp track. And do you? Uh- Consolidated or something at some oh, point. Oh, I might. Yeah, I might consolidate so that it or something. Go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this is the comp track. Yeah, I might, I might consolidate it, but more importantly, just seeing that letter C makes me know that it's the one on top. Sometimes it, it'll put that in a long list of takes, and it'll stick that randomly in the middle of the list. And if you put a space before the first letter of the word, that Pro Tools will put your at the top. track at oh, the top like of the that. list. So that yeah, sort of I, always I guess keeps probably, it at the top there. Noticed that before and didn't think about it. And, that, you know, who knows? That, that might be true in other DAWs as well. But yeah. we'll, we'll jump back on topic here. So I wanted to also have a takeaway from your inspirational quote, which I thought was great. Ironically, you talk about thinking outside of the box. And the first example was getting into the box, you know, with Pro Tools the first time around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you you talked about also that process of being young and in the studio and wanting to get in there and and you think you've got all these great ideas. And I specifically remember that exact same feeling. So when I started out at Alex the Great with Robin Eaton and Brad Jones, Mm -hmm. here are these guys making the coolest records I've heard. And I'm sitting there as this young kid going, 
thinking that like I've got an ear for hi-fi and I'm going to bring, <laughs> I'm going to help these guys start to make right. hi-fi records, you know, for the records that they're making so well. And it, you know, there's, it takes me back to this quote from Ira Glass that has been shared around a lot. And, and Graham Cochran on the show had brought it up once, which is the, the concept that at first we develop our taste. Mm-hmm. So we become really great listeners and we really right. know what our taste is. And that's long before we develop our abilities. So I think that maybe has a lot to do with why as the young guys, we show up and we're like, oh man, I would do it this way. I would do it this way. And, exactly. You know, we got so much to learn, but but we already have an idea of what we think about everything. Well, the other thing that enthralled me with recording was uh, at the time I was listening to the, the Alan Parsons' I, Robot album back in 1976, 77, and of course, Dark Side of the Moon. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, how do they do this? What's going on here? And then I started noticing differences. I'd listen to some record and I'd go, why is that bass? I, I was used to being in a rock band and I know what a bass sounds like. And I'd hear this bass sound and I'd go, why does it not sound like an amplifier? What are they doing? What is, oh, dir- they plugged it directly into the console or whatever. You know, I didn't know what they did. I just knew that it, that's not what a bass sounds like. And you knew that because you had some experience in the studio recording. Well, I'm talking about uh, when I was actually getting the four track and I would be, I would be listening. To, well, actually, when we did the recording, they mic'd the bass. So I didn't even know about, maybe they took it direct too, but I didn't even know that because I was the guitar player. I didn't care about anybody else except for myself, but uh, (laughs) I'm kidding. I'd only done this one recording session. And so then when I started doing the four track, I realized, okay, so they, they, they don't always mic the bass. They, they run it direct. And so I started noticing all those differences, but when I got in the studio and I, and like you said earlier, we thought we knew exactly what was going on. I realized I didn't know anything really other than what I'd experienced at home. And the main thing was to just sit back and shut up and do what you were told. And you just bit your lip all the time during sessions. I can remember, this is before I was even working with Parliament and George and all those people. I was in on these a lot of R&B sessions for a couple of years. I was the assistant and I just had to fight suggesting things all the time because I thought I knew better, but I didn't know better. And I learned by sitting back and listening and watching people who actually had made records for 10 or 15 years. So it was a great experience. And so then when I was thrown into the fire of having to uh, the one day, oh, you got to punch George in on, on some vocals. Okay. <laughs> and then you're just like scared to death. Yeah. And you're thrown into the fire and you just start doing it. And the next thing you know, like we, we were doing funk parliament funkadelic 24 7 uh we had three or four engineers we actually had it was like a factory and i would work during the day and then there was another guy that i'd work well at, at first i would work really late and then we started getting other engineers and then we'd actually broke it up in shifts and from like 10 in the morning to six then from six to one and then from one to eight in the morning <laughs> <laughs> and so it's funny. I used to be a big fan of one to eight in the morning, and now I'm a big fan of ten to six. Uh, me too. <laughs> I'm <a> total. <laughs> fan. I, I I got tired of the the all night sessions uh, early on, but but I was never able to avoid them until recently. It, it was amazing how much stamina that some of these artists would have when I'd work with Bootsy. We'd come, he he actually liked to start early, but he would also go really late. We'd start at ten in the morning, and we'd go till two in the morning. Because he was just so focused on what he wanted to do in one day. Yeah, that creativity can really drive you. And when you got great people to work with, like yourself as an engineer, I mean, it's it drives you even more. Yeah, and it, it, I don't know about that. I don't know how good I was when I was doing that, but I was getting, I was learning how to get better at it. But he, you know, he had a plan. He always had a plan on how he was going to get from point A to Z in a day. And we would record one song every day. And it, 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 the strangest thing with him was some of his songs would just start out, you would not expect this, but they would start out with an ovation acoustic guitar. Really? And he would have the song in his head. He knew everything that was going to be on the record. And he had a basic idea of the structure. And we would sit there with the, we called it the man in the box. It was just a little drum machine. It wasn't even a drum machine. It was basically the workings of a, like a Roland, um, toy organ thing that has like the bossa nova beat and the, you know the rock beat <laughs> yeah. and that was the click track he'd pick a tempo he'd start playing and pick a tempo we'd print a click track and then he would just work his way through a song on an acoustic guitar and then after that he'd go out and play drums and he'd have the whole thing in his head and then he had a keyboard player and that guy would put on who was named uh, uh, david lee spradling who else 
also co-wrote Atomic Dog. They would just work their way up with this, you know, acoustic guitar, then a piano or drums, and then piano and drums. And then they'd start adding all these other keyboards and synths and more real guitars, you know, electric guitars. He'd lay down some kind of scratch vocal. And then he'd bring in singers. He'd have, they'd be on call. They'd come in at three in the afternoon and start doing background vocals. It was like that with all the acts that were associated with George Clinton. They basically had these different groups of musicians and singers that worked together and create different songs. And they were creating them all for George. Even if it was for a Bootsy album, sometimes the song might end up on a Parliament album or end up on a Funkadelic album because George would go, I really like that song. Can we put that on a Funkadelic record. That's great, man. That's great. What a trip. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny too to hear you talk about that and to know from my own listening experience. You know, I'm also a big fan of the Meters, which, uh, you know, yeah, New, sure. New, Orleans New Orleans funk sound, yeah. right? A big difference, which I never, I could always hear, but now with you telling the story, it's clear is that starting with a click track. You know, the Meters, I don't think ever played with a click track. Right. And the Parliament. They funk always, sound was always like very like on the grid. It was very yeah, precise. I think so, some, I guess George must have discovered that or somebody did, you know, back in middle 70s or something. And they just started doing it. And they, they didn't use drum machines or anything. It was always real guys. Yeah. Like Bootsy was an amazing drummer. Yeah, I, mean, I can believe He would it. go out and play drums. And, and it was like he just had a pocket that was deep. He couldn't play jazz or anything. He couldn't play, you know, crazy stuff. But his pocket was just deep deep and you, you knew that was the track like when he nailed it it was like that's that's it so for some reason i've got like his voice in my head right now hey, and i, I want to say like bubble. let's go play some crazy drums now you know exactly i can't even say it but, I, but i've been hearing it the whole time you're telling the story so rock stars if you're not familiar with parliament funkadelic bootsy collins george clinton go check them out i'll try and include some links in the show notes so you can go listen to it. just great stuff really really, really great great funk yeah and weird <laughs> yeah, so very stuff. weird, very it's weird like, stuff. It, it, and know, very like, creative. They they were always trying to outdo themselves. There were these groups of guys, there were probably three or four different groups of rhythm guys that would come in and they were always trying to outdo each other to make George happy. That what we did is we'd record these songs and put them on a cassette, if you know what that is, and then at the end of the week, George would get a compilation of all the tracks cut all week, and he'd just drive around in his Jeep or something and listen to all the tracks and then pick one that might become a song. That's great. And then he'd come in and put his thing on it. And that's how he a and all his groups of guys. And they were all fighting to get a song on a record is what it was. And so George It's kind of, of the Motown theory. It's, a, it's the way Motown was, too. There were all these different writers, and they were all trying to vie to get a single. Right. All, all these guys were trying to get on one of his records, one of his artists, because there was Parliament, Funkadelic, Parlette, The Brides of Funkenstein, Roger Troutman, Bootsy Collins, and maybe some other ones. And if anybody else knows, they can tell me. <laughs> um, so now, the, and all of this was fueled by, you know, the record industry, right? Now, how, yes. how were these singles, did they see the kind of success that really like poured money in? Or was it like, let's work hard to earn it kind of success? What it was is George was the deal maker. He really was. And he he just had all these concept ideas and he would sell them to the record companies and they would just give him money. Oh, that sounds like a great idea, George. Sure. Yeah. Do that. Do that. Whatever. And they just, they'd give him money to do these projects. And then of course he made money on the back end, but they gave him a lot of money up front to do these things. Because I, I think of the the Funkadelic records and that whole sound and, and they're very iconic and everything. But I don't necessarily, I'm not, maybe I'm just being uh, daft here, but I don't have a single of like a, you know, a hit radio no, single that's coming No, there really mind. weren't any other than um, Flashlight and a couple other ones. Uh, and, um, in, in fact, the whole period that I worked with them, the only song that was huge was Atomic Dog. There, there were a couple records that did okay albums, but they were... He just made concept albums, right? And it was it didn't matter if there were singles. They sold a fair amount of albums. They, it was all about album sales. His public, his fan base loved those records. Right. They a, didn't care if there was anything commercial. A dedicated audience, but there was there was always one song that was super groove, and everyone could dance to it. You know, right. there was just always something right. like that. And if you liked Funkadelic, you're going to love all the records they're doing. Right. And, exactly. and what I appreciate about it too is just you know, rock stars. The takeaway is that just this concept of like. If you believe in something, you know, you just make it happen. Like, you know, George Clinton loves guys just like creating a yeah. factory scene in a studio and a, surrounding yourself with musicians that want to write these songs. And, and he was out. just looking for different artists. That's how he discovered Zap. You know, they were actually a self-contained group and he gave them the opportunity to go in the studio and they were under his label. Eventually they had some legal 
problems. But oh, that was one of the most creative people I ever worked with was Roger Troutman. <clears throat> he was the the head of Zap, uh, and he took the talk box to a whole nother level. I don't know if you've ever listened to any of those I've records. I built my own talk box. Did you? Okay, well. Oh, so rock stars, in case you don't know what a talk box is, it's basically a speaker. Uh, usually it's a horn driver for a horn-driven PA system that just goes, instead of into a, a horn, it just plugs right into a tube and you run the tube up into your mouth and then you play guitar through this tube and, and you use your mouth to sort of mouth the words and the vowels, you know. Um. So I just learned a, a little story about how, how the talk box came about. So there's a guy, it started in Nashville. Did you know that? No, I just, okay. I just assumed it was all Peter Frampton. Yeah, well, this, <laughs> that's part of the story. There's a guy named Pete Drake. He's a steel player. I don't know if he actually invented the talk box. The talking steel, right? He was the talking steel. And he really took it to, you know, I don't know if he invented it. I I don't know that part of the story, but he took it to another level and he learned how to use it. And he would put it on his own records and he would add it to some country records. Well, he got, he was asked to play in England, I think with George Harrison on something. While he was there, he met Peter Frampton. And Frampton was just, loved, he just loved this whole concept. And he said, here, you can have it. I got one at home. And he gave it to Peter Frampton. That's how it started. A guy named Pete Drake was an incredible steel player. I've heard his records. It's, he's amazing. In fact, I'm sure Russ Paul loves Pete. You know, Russ yeah, Paul, yeah. He, he had to have listened to Pete Drake a lot. I'm sure he was an inspiration because I hear a lot of that in what Russ does. He passed it on to uh, Peter Frampton. And I, I assume Peter Frampton must have showed Joe Walsh, you know, and right, Joe Walsh started right. using. And then this guy, Roger Troutman, who was this young African-American guy from Dayton, Ohio, he heard that sound and he went, wait a minute, I can do that with my mini Moog. <laughs> so he bought a talk box and he started doing it with his mini Moog oh, cool. and created a whole new thing. That was a really popular thing back in the early 80s on the Zap Records. It was all about uh, mini Moog talk box. And actually, you can hear it today on the new Bruno Mars single. That's a talk box. And in fact, I think that guy on there, his actual name is Talk Box. He does a lot of uh, overdubs on gospel records, too. They use the talk box on gospel records now, too. That's great. I love it. And talk, it's all with a mini Moog. Talk about niche market. You just get the talk box sound, call yourself Talk Box, and you get exactly. called for all the sessions. And the, 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 but the thing that was really cool about Roger was he took it to another level other than than just using the mini Moog, he was doing three and four part harmonies with it, which Peter Frampton and uh, and Joe Walsh never did. You know, they just did their little thing, but he took it to a whole nother Well, you level. know, when I think about the Bootsy Collins bass sound too, you've got like the, um, oh. the, the uh, oh goodness, what's the phaser that I'm thinking of? Mutron biphase. The Mutron, right. Thank you. The Mutron biphase. And that is like a talk box sound. It's all it those, those phase and, sounds. And that's right. I never mentioned that he actually put the bass on the song. I remember I, I said everything but the bass. So the bass was the last thing that went on at most of his records. Kind of like trip. McCartney putting the bass on Sgt. Pepper's at the end. He would always put the bass on last. And it was kind of an ordeal because he had three outputs out of the star bass. One and three went to echoplexes. <laughs> and other assorted phasers and things. And then two went to uh, Mutron biphase and straight sounds. And so when you worked on a song with Bootsy, you had to use three tracks to record his bass. If he decided to punch in on a one after he finished, you know, on, on beat four, and you know, he'd say, roll back. And if there was an echoplex sound carrying over... it get chopped off. It would get chopped off. So you had to just put track two and record... And punching on the one, and then on beat two, push one and three back into record, so that it would tail oh, off. Man, so that so, was so that was stressful. That was worse than just punching in a vocal. And because, what was the machine? It was, was the uh, uh, MM one thousand. MM one thousand, which wow, you so had to really hard. punch basically on the thirty second note before the one, because <laughs> it was so slow. The relays were so slow. So what that trip, was man. that was a trip recording. Well, so all right, I'm space. glad you took us back into the stressful parts because the next question I'd like to ask you is to tell us. A story about a nightmare in the studio for you. I, I know you already talked about a nightmares and you nightmare. left the studio. A, a failure or a nightmare? What, oh, a whichever nightmare, one you like to do. A nightmare. Sorry, I think I moved away from Mike. A nightmare was working with Sly Stone. That was a nightmare. But it, w it was a nightmare that was fruitful for the future because I learned how to deal with any kind. Was this kind. with Sly in, in his studio? Were you no, this was Sly who, when he was with George, he was hanging out with George Clinton. He was okay. actually on a a record, an album called The Electric Spanking of War Babies. <laughs> wow. But the way Sly worked, because he had a problem with drugs, they had just invented uh, freebase cocaine. And 
he really couldn't last much longer than like 10 minutes without smoking it. He he would set up in the control room and he had his Fender Rhodes right in the control room with a microphone. He had a guitar sitting in there, a drum sitting there, a bass sitting there, other keyboards. And he would just start jamming with himself in a click track and come up with a groove. And this these periods of of energy would last like 10 minutes and would go very fast. He'd find eight bars and he'd go loop it. And then you'd have to print it over to a 16 track and create a couple different versions of that. So that was like a chorus. And then as soon as you did- Hold on, hold on. Explain to the rock stars what looping means in that that world. Well, it wasn't traditional looping where he actually took a piece of tape and looped it around. We actually printed from the 24 track to the 16 track and created a chorus of, of say, Rhodes click track and a vocal guide and then did two or three passes and created a chorus that say or, or four passes so there was a chorus it was four eight bar segments or something and then you had to do it very fast because the next thing he wanted to do was put on a guitar he was all hyper so you'd do it really quick and then put on a guitar then go and put on drums he'd run out and play drums really fast and like he'd literally run across the studio 40 feet you know, 40 or 50 feet to the drum booth and just start playing madly. And <laughs> and wow. I actually, I take, I take that back. Uh, we didn't loop it until after he put the drums and the guitar on. I, I take that back. Once we looped it, then he would put other parts on it. But he had to have the core. He had to have drums, bass, click track, the keyboard. So the loop was vocal. like an eight-bar segment and then a little quiet and then an eight-bar segment. Yeah. And then a little, so he could just kind and of And then he would come up with another thing that might be the verse and you'd have to do the same thing. A couple of sessions, each of them lasted like 16 or 17 hours of madness. Wow. And in between, the, in between those 10 minutes, in between those 10 minutes, he would prepare himself for the next 10 minutes by, you know, doing whatever he had to do to get there. Wow. So why is it when I hear that story, I'm both horrified and, you know, intrigued and mesmerized by it? I mean, what were the It was horrifying the because from I that? was young and uh, didn't know how to, you know, I was learning how to handle a client that was very esoteric, I guess, <laughs> to say the least. But it also was a learning experience of how to, once you did that, you could deal with anything. Then you, you said I was, you felt like I was calm. Well, I, I was. After that, it was like nothing could you know, surpass those kind of sessions. Yeah. You know, that was complete pandemonium. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the value of working quick in the studio because as a creative person, you're, yourself included, you know what this is like. Right. Sometimes you really just want to play the music idea. Music comes and goes from your from your head right. so quickly. Exactly. So, you, yeah. yeah, you want to catch it. And and I appreciated that, you know, about him, that he he had an idea and he wanted to get it out immediately. Well, at least he didn't chop your head off or anything. No, like no, we, we, had, it was really good. It was actually okay. It's just, he probably wouldn't remember me because of his situation. So now here's another question that you probably, um, I didn't send to you in advance. <laughs> was there ever a story of a real aha moment for you in your recording, um, where everything sort of clicked about, you know, maybe recording or your career path or, or, you know, where you needed to go with everything? Your Pro Tools story was a bit of one uh, yeah. to begin with, you know. The realization of moving to Nashville was a, an aha moment. When I, you know, I worked in Detroit up until uh, 91. I, I moved here in 92. And one year in 91, a, a producer here asked me to come to Nashville and mix something. And the aha moment was... I went into Digital Recorders, which was Norbert Putnam's studio, and I was working on this commissioned record there. And then in another studio, Take Six was in another room. Leonard Skinner was in another room, and Barry Beckett was there, and all the guys from Muscle Shoals were there. And I'm like, the aha moment was like, I've got to move here because this this is like an amazing scene. You know, these people are all working together. They're competitors to some extent, but they're all sharing ideas. And that was amazing because Detroit, we kind of got isolated into one studio. Uh, You know, I worked at that studio with the funk people. And that was a great thing because there were a lot of different musicians moving around. But after that, when I became independent, you'd get stuck in one place working and you'd only work with a couple artists at a time. There was only one room. So there wasn't a lot going on around you. When I came to Nashville and I saw this camaraderie that was going on and the sharing of information, I like I met Tony Shepard, who's an engineer who lives in LA now, and he was working on Take Six. And he'd say, gosh, did you ever try these mic breeze? These are amazing. Like, you'll just, you know, and you never had those kind of conversations in Detroit. Yeah. In fact, 
uh, going back, the first console I worked on was API at the studio. And I didn't even know how good that was. I didn't realize that was the cream of the crop. I just learned on it. And I, I don't want to discount MCI, but... <laughs> yeah, please don't, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there was a time, because this is a customized MCI that you have here. Right. This I got, is, I this got is a stock one. This discreet. one, the Jeep actually made this one. And I know the records that were cut on this, but I got... I had to go in and work on MCI that wasn't in very good condition. And I realized, wow, th this doesn't sound as good as the APIs. I, and I didn't know how to fix it because it wasn't like, like in your studio right here, you've got an MCI and you prob probably use some of those mic pre's for certain things. And then use those Neves over there for, you know, other things and whatever else you have in the room. Yeah. But in, De in Detroit, you didn't have that. It was whatever the console was, that's what you had for mic pre's. Right. You didn't have any selection. But once I came here, I realized, wow. When you go into a studio here, even in 1991, they have a, an array of, of of tools that you could choose from, and you could learn to expand your horizons uh, as far as uh, quality sound. Well, so let's bring that fast forward to the present. Now, if you're starting out in recording or you're learning this stuff, to begin with, the default tools, you know, I've got a PreSonus um, interface right here, the Studio 192 uh -huh. interface. It sounds fantastic. You, know, yeah. you plug a mic into it, it sounds clean, yeah. great. It doesn't sound yeah, sure. broken. And in the world of plugins and things like that, you have all these different um, color palettes and everything. What What do you see as a difference now between trying to learn how to record versus them? What are the similarities? I mean, you mix and you use a lot of plugins. Yeah, you're, mixing, you're, I use a, a lot of plugins and I'm always searching for new things. And are you in the box a lot? I'm in the box. Thinking the, outside the box, but thinking mixing outside of the box, box, but I'm in the box all the time. I have been for, uh, since 2009. Today, it's, it's amazing what you can do. Like you just said, I, like I could, I would, you know, just have my Apollo. I would also have a, have a couple of Neves that I go, you know, have with me and a couple of summits and then maybe, if I to record a band, I'd have something, some kind of ADAT thing that could interface with the Apollo, and then I could cut, you know, 16 tracks all at once. You couldn't even think about doing that back then because you'd have to drag around this MCI 24 track. In fact, I remember actually being tossed into situations in Detroit where someone would say they had a studio, and you'd walk in and they'd have a they'd have a 24 track, but then they'd have like this Tascam console that the mic pre sounded like crap, and you'd run some instruments to it, through it and you'd go I can't even get this to sound like anything. So today you have all these opportunities like you said that 192 the the mic pre sound good in it, right? Yeah. You couldn't right. you couldn't do that back then. It, it it didn't happen and today you can do it and 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 you can complement it with your own stuff. Now what about plugins? I mean you do you have a lot of experience with plugins. Do you find that plugins and getting to learn them and mess around with them is a real slippery slope for you? Or do you find that um, it's wonderful and you spend a lot of time like trying out all kinds of different oh, stuff? Yeah, it's it's like a kid in a candy store. I love I love the technology today. Uh, you know, the, the stuff that Slate's doing is just amazing. Uh, I love the, the tape machines, you know, the new 1176 that he has. It's so, so great. So let me dig in because you've done some great recordings. You've done some I've done Great some bad mixes. ones too. <laughs> well, that's good. A good reminder for everybody to know you have to do the bad ones to do the great ones. Give us some tips for how to get a great kick and snare mix. What, what should? What are some in the mix? Yeah. Oh, first of all, you know some things to think about. Well, when I'm tracking, I, I can't go anywhere without my Neve thirty three one one fours. I love those for for tracking. And and if you if I can track it, I can get a decent kick and snare sound right off the bat with that. That's our Mike Prees or our Mike Prees. Mike Prees. Okay, uh, 33 are Mike Prees. I don't know. What, what are those right there? Those are actually Calrec um, well, PQ 1161, like I believe. Looks like they kind of were, were taking the idea of a 33114, which is a neat broadcast Mike Pre and EQ. With that, I can get a decent sound, a really decent punchy sound right off the bat. When it comes to mixing, there's times when I get really bad input from uh, people who've recorded. And so I compliment with samples. You know, I, I'll take the sounds that they have and go as far as I can. And then I'll start layering and trying to get it to sound as real and punchy as possible with using samples. But I always try to get the original, say for the snare, the stick hit, you know, from the, from the actual snare. I fight really hard to get the sound that the drummer was trying to get and then I'll layer below that, mm -hmm. unless it's so bad that I can't use it. 
generally speaking, I work really hard to get the snare to sound like something and then complement it and make it bigger because sometimes it just has to blow through the track, you know, and it, it can't because a lot of these gospel tunes are very dense. There, mm-hmm. There's a lot of instruments. Some wimpy snare sound can't even get through it. Right. You know, they can't, it can't get through it. So I'll build up a, an array of samples behind the original snare. And a lot are the gospel albums typically created in in many layers, kind of like the stuff that you described for the funk uh, recordings, where you know maybe the drums were recorded early on and then all the layers were added later. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, they they usually because a lot of the stuff I do is live. Usually, there's a drums, bass, and and a few keyboards and a guitar on the original tracking sessions. But then they start layering all the other stuff because. Then they decide they want to put strings on it, they want to put horns on it, and then they put 124 tracks of background vocals on it. And I'm not kidding. That happens all the time. We spend usually a day, and I say we, my assistant Adam Smith, we spend hours just compiling background vocals to get it into a a semblance of a mix so that I don't spend all the next day thinking about background vocals, I get them down to a few tracks, you know, six yeah. to eight tracks yeah. instead of 124 tracks just sitting there and make decisions about the blend between all the different parts before I ever start mixing and cleaning them up, getting rid of all the pee pops and all the noises in between. Cause I'll, I'll get tracks and there's, it's just raw, yeah. raw 124 tracks is a nightmare. Paper rustlings and foot oh, stompings everything. on the, so, on the, I've taught my assistants how to do that. They go through it and they clean all that stuff up before it ever gets to me. But they've been taught to do it right. And it works out really well. I've got this guy that I work with now, Adam. And I always say we when we're working on records because he spends so much time. It is. (laughs) It's a team. It's always a team. It's it's not just me, he and I, but it's... It's the producer too, you know, the, and the and the artist, of course, and that that's the whole team and trying to get a record done. Yeah, yeah. Even when, when you're mixing, it's it's a it's a whole team effort. It, once you get the reference point of the mix, you have to work with the producer and say, "Is this where you want to go, or do you want to go here?" You know. Yeah. All right. So let me keep jumping forward here. Um, when you are mixing and you take all these massive number of tracks and you simplify it, what's in front of you when you're actually in that mix mode? Do you like to have hands on faders that are controlling Pro Tools or do you use your mouse in the computer? How I do, do a do combination that? of both. I've got like eight channel, just eight faders, just a combination of that, push up the faders, get it going, uh, start developing a, a rough mix. And then so, so eight once, faders means you can't have a fader for everything in the mix. No, and I don't care. Because I can push it up really fast and get an idea for the song. And then once I get that going, I'm, the mix, I can just sit there with a mouse or with a fader, moving specific things into place. And once I get the whole overall concept of the mix, then I can pretty much just use one or two faders to ride for automation. And, and I'm a guy that worked on 80 and 96 input consoles before with faders everywhere. And I don't miss it at all. Yeah. In fact, I don't use the mix page in Pro Tools. I, I never use, I'm always on the editing page mm-hmm. and I do a lot of work in clip gain. I'm constantly clip gaining things up or down, mostly down because everyone cuts too hot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and pull things in so I can use less compression, say on a vocal. You can work your way through a vocal really quick with clip gain and make some dynamic moves that if you just throw a compressor on it, it crushes crap out of the vocal. Mm -hmm. And I can say, well, this line right here is just going to kill a compressor. I can pull it back and it's still going to have the same dynamics that it originally had without it being killed by the compressor. So I know everything. And when I do use compression, I I mean, I do, I use a lot of compression, but I'm doing slightly gain different gain stages, you know? Yeah. So uh, I love hearing about that. And I love that concept of really preparing your tracks before the mix and using the benefits of clip gain are there some typical EQ and tonal changes that happen when you're getting into clip gain that we should be aware of? For example, the quiet bits that we clip gain up, do they always need a low cut, an extra low cut on it? Or or loud bits, do they need different EQs? It, it, yeah, it, it can happen for sure. Overall, I'm, I'm probably going to have high pass filters on things. And, I, and when I get into specific areas of a song, I'll audio suite EQs on groups of tracks, especially when, like in these situations, like uh, just a couple of days ago, I was working on a track and we got the 124 tracks down to about, I don't know, 16 groups of soprano altos and tenors, like stereo tracks, eight, I think it was, no, it was more than that. It was probably 16 stereo tracks. There was a section in a verse where the, the group was singing the verse, but they were, it was in a really low register. So I just 
audio suited all the tracks with, I found out frequencies that worked. I'll just grab all these tracks. I'll think, well, this needs a nice shelf on it and, and, and then roll some low end off of it. And, and, uh, and if it, if it's too bright or it's too thin, then I'll just undo it. And then, and I'll know exactly where to set the EQ. Okay. I can drop that right. in a couple DB, blah, 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 and hit that whole section. And all of a sudden it just pops out in that verse. And then when we get to the chorus, you know, I don't want it that way. So it's, it would get too harsh. So I don't EQ it. And a lot of people will do that with automation, but I will commit to it because I know I have duplicate tracks underneath it. If I don't like it later, I can always go back to the original. Yeah. And I'll and, do that with, even for effects, I'll, I'll flange a whole section of a song, all the backgrounds or something with, you know, meta flanger or something, you know, anything just to get something different yeah. and commit to it, almost commit to it. I know, I, I know I'm not completely committed because I know there's a, <laughs> there's a playlist below it. If the artist doesn't like it, I can put it back. Well, there's a lot more, um, parts that are, you know, precariously balanced when you're relying on automation to do all these things for you than when you just simply process the track so that all you're doing is playing back an audio file and, all, and you know, mm -hmm. it frees up the fader on your Absolutely. Pro Tools mix. It frees up your yeah. pans, all kinds of stuff, your mute button. Yep. And you don't have to ride as much. You don't have to ride things as much. All right. So um, that sounds like quite a lot of work to get yourself to the point where you're actually just balancing and mixing. When you are at that point, what are some things, you talked about getting bass sounds that sound great. What are some things that we should know about getting the bass to sit just right in a mix? How do we know that we've got our low end right? That's a big challenge for a lot of us. Everyone has different philosophies. My philosophy is just take it one one track at a time. If, if it means in this song, you have to roll off some low end on the bass to get the kick to sit right, do that. But I, I don't have any rules as far as that goes. It's whatever is going on at the moment in the song. I can change the EQ on the bass or the kick anywhere in the song if I have to. So I have all those tools to do that. I don't have any one set way of doing it. And, it's, and most of it, it's by feel. Yeah. If it doesn't feel right to me, and I'll just keep working it, whether it's rolling things off or or boosting. And sometimes I just let the bass hang out. It can just hang out. People are afraid of bass. It can hang out, man. I mean, like, like be big bass. <laughs> yeah, it can be mix. big, unless the producer doesn't want it big. But generally speaking, most people want the bass big and they want the kick big. So you just you figure out a way to do it. And it, there's no set way of doing it. I, I, I There's no trick. There's a lot of guys that say, oh, I do this on every song. No, that's baloney. Right, right. You, you, you can't do that on every now, song. Now, is there a place that you trust where you know that you've screwed up the bass? Yeah. I mean, you mean listening wise? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. In my room, you mean? Usually it's listening for me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I meant in my room, my listening space. Yeah. Where in yeah. your world, you know? Uh, in my world, I mean, I, I, I mix on atoms with a subwoofer and I can tell in certain parts of my room when I've gone too far or, yeah. or not enough. And then I have my little reference speakers, uh, Panasonic speakers that I listen on. I can tell when I've gone too far or not enough. You know, I can, I can just, obviously it's listening, but you, you have your reference and you know when we've gone too far or, or not enough. Yeah. So for example, for me, one of the struggles is that my studio monitors can handle so much more than anything else I listen to on. So if I don't get it right, it still sounds pretty great. You know, the low end can sound huge. It still sounds great. And I can crank it up, no problem. But then I go try and, you know, listen in the car, for example, playing an MP3 off of SoundCloud. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I can't handle that low end at all. And that, those are the places. And well, you know, most so of the time, I, I go back and forth a lot. Right. Well, I have done that too. And and of course, your client will tell you too if you've gone too far. <laughs> but I can usually tell if my subwoofer if my subwoofer is blowing up, I've got a problem. <laughs> you know, I can I can pretty much tell where the low end is just by what's going, how that's reacting yeah. in the room, and what it sounds like in the back of the room. So there's no science to it. It's right, mostly so, feel. So um, here's a question: How about uh, you know, I hear this a lot from the rock stars is just that they want to get more clarity and punch in their mix. What does that mean to you? And, and what are some ways to just maintain a lot of clarity and, and forward punch in your mix? I guess the opposite would be muddy and, muddy, and you, undefined. You, I love muddy and undefined. No, <laughs> I mean, it really depends on, of course, what you, what you have there. And uh, if, if you have to add, you know, three or 4k to something, you know, uh, to make it stand out, you, you just do it. And, and, uh, if, if, if it becomes a problem, 
uh, in a different part of the song. Either you automate it out or you can use multiband compression. So you can make something really punchy. And then if it gets goes too far, you can use multiband compression to pull it back. Or you can just literally go in and, like I said earlier with the, the background vocals, I'll make them really bright in some sections. And then they're already bright because they actually hit the right notes and their 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 tone was there. So I can leave the EQ the way I originally said it. It's it's always a fight with masking and arrangement. I find it interesting that there are a lot of people that make records and don't even think about the arrangement, right. which drives right. me crazy. And they'll have pianos and vocals singing the exact same parts. And so you just find frequencies, say for the vocals, the air will go above the mid-range of the piano and you can make the mid-range of the piano speak out and... You just kind of find that blend between those. It's sort of two, decision two. making, right? It's like you've got these different zones of frequency in your mix, and you sort of have to decide, all right, well, who who gets it? Who gets the attention exactly. right here yeah, in and, this moment? It, yeah, and you can you can fake people out by turning up one instrument in one section, and then another time bring up the other instrument later on, and then they everyone thinks, oh wow, I heard the organ. I know the organ's there, you know, but I didn't hear it here. But who cares? Because the piano is being featured here, so. There's always that moment where you can feature different things. That's a big trick in country mixing, too, where you got to like the fiddle just jumps out and fills in between the vocal parts and things like that. Most of the country music I've worked on in the past, usually the arrangements are really are done well. I think Uh, the musicians that arrange them live in the studio really know what they're doing. It's amazing how like in between a vocal, there's always something there and you don't go, oh, just turn it up a dB and it's there. It's pretty amazing. It's a it's a testimony to the musicians that live here. And on that note, I as far as musicianship for your rock stars who get frustrated with with sounds, where you go, God, I can't get the acoustic to sound like it did on this record. Well, I hate to tell you this, but it's usually the musicians that that make the record in Detroit because I record a lot of funk and R and B. There weren't a lot of great acoustic guitar players. I tried all different types of miking techniques, you know, stereo miking, mono miking, miking up close, miking things back, tried everything I could. And you'd go, eh, I'm never really happy. Uh, one time I actually heard uh, a, a tape from Muscle Shoals. I happened to work on a track with, from Muscle Shoals in Detroit. And I'm like, how the heck do they get these acoustics to sound this way? And it just baffled me. And I kept trying it with different guitar players and I could never get it to sound that way. Well, when I moved to Nashville, the first session I did on a country session with was with a guitarist named Chris Lusinger. And I, I went, well, here we go. Here we go again. I, and I, I did a stereo miking technique on him. And I had API mic prees. And I walked into the control room and he started strumming. And I went, I threw my pencil up in the air and I went, that's the sound. I'm not doing anything <laughs> different. I'm not even needed here. <laughs> that's the sound. It's the player. It's the instrument. And you don't realize it until you hear it and you go, oh, my God. And, and the same thing happened in Detroit as far as pianos were concerned. Back in Detroit, there would be players that I would record different players on the same piano. And then one day, Thomas Whitfield came in and he sat down and he started playing. And I went, oh, uh, that was an oh, my gosh experience. Like, oh, I'm not doing anything different. And it sounds like a totally different piano. Same thing when Edwin Hawkins came in. But then some... Local guy who played decently, he'd sit down and it would be like all over again. I'm EQing, I'm trying to make it bigger. Edwin Hawkins comes in, bam! Like, oh my God, I've never felt that much low end before in my life. I thought you turned off your phone. (laughs) Yeah, so did I. (laughs) Every time. Same story. So, um, uh, so so it's it's about the musicians 90% of the time. Same thing with bass, because I would fight with bass sounds. Speaking of bass, and when I came to Nashville, all the bass players are just tremendous here. They all have their sound. They, it, some of them, they have unique sounds, some, some not so unique, but they all sound good. And it's not hard to put those kind of basses in songs when the player's touch is there. Yeah. Do you find that a lot, sometimes a lot of what makes a bass sound great and big is the space where the bass is not? You know, it's the fact that the player leaves space so that when the bass speaks, it really comes out of the track Absolutely. for a moment in yeah. the right, right sure. spots. Sure, sure. Especially you notice it like on a reggae thing where the bass player would play in between the kick drum, you know, and you're going, whoa, that feels amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah it's definitely, that definitely plays a big part of it. I've noticed with really good live musicians, 
the bass player will play a hair behind the the kick on purpose. I'm not not I'm I'm not I'm not, not talking like milliseconds. I'm I mean like 20 milliseconds. I'm just talking like one or two. And all of a sudden the kick is there and the bass is there just because of where he is in the pocket. And you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Where you, there are times when you, you know, you may key the the bass to compress on on beat one off of the kick drum to try to get the kick to stand out. You know, you're you're constantly fighting back and forth yeah. between the kick and I don't ever have one way of doing it. So Rockstars, when he talks about keying what that is, is that saying, let's put a compressor on the bass track, but we'll have the compressor's threshold be triggered by the kick drum. So that when the kick hits, the bass just goes away a little bit right in that moment and then comes back in. So that's a great trick to do. I messed around with that. I think I just used that on a recent mix. I still feel like I don't ever know if it's really a good idea or not. <laughs> no, you just got to try the, I do it, the turn same it on thing. and off. You're like, is this better yeah, yeah. or worse? No, you're constantly fighting with that. And, and then you just hope that you made the right decision. Yeah. And then you just live with it. <laughs> Well, so now how about um, something that, that our rock stars can take away as far as um, stuff to think about on the master bus? You know, we're all, most of us are all mixing in the box now. You got any great um, go-to, and maybe not, you know, specifically, you always do this, but here's some things to look at as far as what might sound cool on your master bus. Yeah. Uh, like I'll use the Waves SSL compressor. As far as a l- little bit of limiting, I use the, the PSP Vintage Warmer. And then the, it just depends, but the Pug, Poltec, EQ, sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, I always have the um, Slate tape machine Yeah, 99% of the time. Yeah. I love the way that that sounds. As far as Slate, I love that uh, Neve EQ that emulates a 1076, except for it has two mid-range bands, which is amazing. Right, right. And like that can really, like when you get the mix going and you just tweak a little bit of that and it like opens up and you go, whoa. <laughs> it's, so the, those are some plugins that I use all the time. Yeah, and it's funny how that EQ really does have that sort of Neve quality. It does. To the way that EQ is. I don't know what he did, how he did it, but it sounds amazing. And it works great on almost any instrument. Anytime I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Let's try that. <laughs> you know. So what about the order in which you might arrange those plugins on the master bus? What comes the SSL first? SSL would be last? first. And that's the SSL compressor, the quad compressor. Just a um, and yeah. when when you're compressing, does the needle move a lot on that? No, or just a I know little that. Bit or no, what? it doesn't. I try if I if it starts moving too much, I'll pull the whole mix down. That's what happens is it, it'll be on there all the time, and if the mix starts getting out of hand, then I just go and literally pull down every track, uh, you know, or, and or groups, aux aux re, re, returns of you know, the drums or whatever, pull everything back until that thing is only hitting one or two dB. When it starts going past that, then I'm like, ah, oh, no, this is, I'm, I've lost it. Let's pull things down. And uh, <clears throat> so, the, you know, the, the PSPs last, the tape machine is usually right after, it shouldn't, it should be probably before the limiter or right before the limiter, but I'll put some other things in between. I always like to think about, that stuff is, you know, what would I do in the studio before Pro Tools? You know, I was right. like, I would have probably, my console would go out and go through a, st- a stereo compressor. Yeah. And then I'd have to print it on something. So I'd send it to the tape machine. And then after you printed it, it'd go to the mastering guy and he might like bring it back right. in through an, an EQ and a compressor and yeah. a limiter. Or That's something what I like do that, think you know? about that. I just found the tape machine sounds best after the, the SSL. And then I'll even use some other uh, compression after that. I think that I, I would say the Neve is probably right before the um, limiter. Well, Yash, we're about to take a break here, and then we'll come in for the jam session, our round of, of quick questions on our way out. Um, before we do, I'd like to, again, thank you for being on the show with us. Our guest today is John Yash, a.k.a. the Yashman. And Rockstars, I'll have links to all this in the show notes, which you can find at rsrockstars.com, or you can just go look for the show notes on your podcast player if you're on your mobile phone, and you should be able to just click right through the link with your finger. See you guys in just a sec for the jam session. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. 
With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444. 444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, we're back for the jam session. I'm here with my guest today, John Yash. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Yash, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. Sweet, man. All right, so when you were starting out and recording, what was one of the things that was holding you back? What was a real obstacle for you? First started, I would say, myself. I thought I could do what I'm doing now without the guidance of other people. And I just had to force myself to take that first step and learn the basics of recording and learn learn how to work with people and and to continue learning everything I can about recording and about the business to further my longevity in the business. But along the way, when you start getting good at what you do, you get a little over self-confident. The one important lesson or failure that I learned <laughs> from a failure was never saying, I can't in front of a client or to a client. You can always do, if someone asks you to do something, just do it, you know, figure out a way to do it. If, it, if it's about changing, you know, the vocal sound or can you put this here, even if it seems impossible, if, if it sounds stupid, just do it anyways. It only t- it usually only takes five minutes. Back in the day, it might take longer, you know, <laughs> it's not as easy as it is today. But generally speaking, even back in the day, if someone said to try this, you could just try it and, and it would take, you know, anywhere from five minutes to an hour to do it. And sometimes you actually might learn something from it. One time when I was working with a co-writer of uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine, his name was Barrett Strong, amazing talent, uh, great songwriter, of course. And we were working on a project. There was something wrong, like the vocal wasn't loud enough or something. And back then we didn't have total recall, but I could pretty much get back to the mix if I wanted to. I knew my memory was really good back then. I could patch in my whole setup within 10 minutes and remember basically where all the EQs were. And we did have fader automation, so that worked. And I told him on the phone, no, I can't. And he just went, really? You can't do that, huh? All right, I'll find somebody else. We'll, we'll do, let's do the record over. So I was fired. Wow. <laughs> so anyways, never say I can't. It's always easier to just try something. You know, what have, what have you got to lose? Yeah. Um, I think that's great advice. And rock stars, I want to encourage you to remember, you know, take away from what Yash is talking about, wanting to learn stuff, wanting to be around, you know, and have an opportunity to be learning from people who always be learning. That's why I've created Recording Studio Rockstars is to give you that opportunity to learn and hear from people and and just take away as much as you can. And so you have great opportunities today. We didn't have these opportunities that you have. You can listen to a podcast. You can um just scour the internet. Back then we had like three magazines and a book called Modern Recording Techniques. And then then hopefully you were in a studio. I, I was fortunate enough to be with Bob Dennis who mastered 30 million selling records. And another guy, Greg Riley, who was an incredible mix engineer at a, age 25 already. And I was learning from him and soaking it up. But you have the opportunity to watch people on the internet and listen to exactly what they're doing. It's It's an amazing world we live in right now. Yeah, so take advantage of it, rock stars, and congratulations on being here in the first place listening to this. So, Yash, how about sharing with us some of the best advice you received? Well, first, 
first one was I can't. But then this, as far as recording, I find that a lot of young people are doing this and it's driving me crazy, is don't over compress when you're tracking, especially vocals. Yeah, you can, you know, you can squash the drums or whatever and do some kind of experiment, but also record the drums straight. Unless you're the producer. If you're the producer and you want to scrunch something and that's the sound you're going for, or you're the producer engineer working with the producer and everybody agrees on it, great. But if you know that it may be sent on to another person, God, don't over compress things, don't, especially vocals, because you can't change it. You can't fix it. And unless you unless you're absolutely positive that's the sound you're going for, it's not going to change much. And there and there are people that know how to do it where it becomes the the sound of the record and I get that. But not every record is like that. You know, yeah. uh I uh years ago I worked in a studio where Cheryl Crow had been and she was amazing. They told me about the process of her doing her vocals. She did over compress her vocals on purpose, but she knew how to hit the compressor. As a singer, they had a setting that worked for her, and she sang. And what what you heard on those records, all of her records, is exactly what they did on the tracking session. They hardly ever changed her vocal later on in the mix. That's one time to do it, if the singer and the engineer and the producer are all on the same page. But generally speaking, come on, don't do it. And Bob Dennis told me, don't compress over 3 dB. You'll ruin everything. Yeah. All right. Good advice. Good advice. Now, how about uh, sharing another recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that our rock stars could use in their studio today? Uh, here's a tip for live recording. Usually when I'm doing, when I'm done live recordings, and I, and I work on a lot of live recordings, the worst thing that can happen with a live recording is that someone distorts the lead vocal. And so whenever I'm on the truck with an engineer, I always have... Uh, or with, you know, whoever is manning the main part of the ship, I always have him run the lead vocal into two mic pre's, and basically we set a level for the normal vocal, including their peaks, but sometimes a vocalist can eat the microphone, so we malt into another mic pre and drop at 10 to 15 dB with a pad so that if we get in a situation where they do kill it, we always have that other track and we can just gain it back up. Interesting. Uh, for, because... It's not going to add any noise because they're going to hit some peak level that completely distorted Pro Tools, distorted the preamp, and but this this other track will just be down 10, 15 dB or even lower. But if they're hitting a really loud note, you just turn it up and gain it back up and pop it into the comp vocal and you've got a clean vocal. Okay, so to ask sort of a specific tech question on that, what do you need in order to split a mic signal into two mic preamps? Just like that? when it when you bring it into the control room in, in the patch bay, you just malt the microphone into two separate preamps. The mic's coming in into the patch bay and then just malt out of that into two separate pre say an API or something. Let's just take an API. And normally on a gospel vocal, you just turn the gain all the way down, maybe, but not put the mic pre in, or the, the pad in. But then on the other one, pop the pad in and malt it over to that one and then record it to two separate tracks in Pro Tools or your analog tape machine. Very cool. Are there some things to watch out for when you malt a mic there where you could inadvertently be, you know, screwing up the impedance of your sound or something like that, something that people should be aware of? Or do you just simply just pull the patch and listen and if it doesn't yeah, it mess I mean, the sound up? Yeah, I mean, for sure. If it, if it changes, then then there's definitely something wrong somewhere. But I haven't, ha I haven't experienced that. Okay, cool, you know, cool. But I'm sure it can happen. All right, Groovy. So just to reiterate that, Rockstars, if you're splitting a signal and going into two things, it's a great trick for getting a mic into two mic pre's. It can be a great trick for taking the signal out of a mic pre and hitting two different compressors or something like yeah. that. But in each of those instances, mute the second track. Just listen to that first one, your, your original intended recording track, and pull the patch on that malt in and out and just see if it messes up your sound because you just want to be aware of that. So just something to watch out for. Um, all right. Now, Yash, how about sharing with us a favorite hardware tool, something that you're always glad you've got this physical thing <laughs> with you on sessions or mixing? Uh, there's a couple of things. The Neve 33114 or any kind of Neve pro product for capturing drums. I love Neve, especially those because I have them. I always get a consistent sound. The EQ sounds great. The, the mic pre won't distort if you set it correctly. And uh, I, love, I love Summit compressors for vocals. So I, I, I love those. So those are the two things that I always carry around with me when if I'm going to do a tracking session. Yeah, we used to use a lot of Summit compressors and mic pre's 
up at uh, Butch Fig Studio, Smart Sound, up okay. in, in Madison, Wisconsin, when I was there a bunch. Um, they were great. I haven't used them in a long time, though. They, they build a lot of tube gear, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So now how about a favorite software tool for the studio? Something that uh, people should know about. The FabFilter Saturn multi-band tape and amp saturation. That thing's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Like if I get a, a bass that just doesn't have any feeling to it, I'll put the tape saturation on the low end and then like amp distortion or overdrive in the mid range and just find, you know, move the the band around and find the frequency sound the best. And it's startling how you can get almost tape compression and have an amp sound like, wow, it almost sounds like an amp heck <laughs> amp all of a sudden uh it's it's a great little box and you can you can use it in all sorts of ways i mean you can use it to distort vocals you can do anything with it but i've just found it as a great tool to save basses uh that aren't recorded great or they're just tired even though i mentioned all the nashville bass players are great it still happens where sometimes you'll get basses in from other places that don't have any feeling Bases from other places places well, from other places one of the things that's Interesting about bass, even with a great bass performance and a great bass sound, sometimes in order to make the bass read in the mix without having it cranked up loud, you need a little more sort of harmonic overtone to it, right? And then it'll start showing up in the smaller speakers. Um, And I'm glad you brought up FabFilter. Recently, actually, I just did a a review on YouTube of the FabFilter Pro-Q too. Yeah, I use that um, all plugin, the time. which is fantastic, man. Yeah. Those guys are making some really great plugins. They, it, it, they really are. So shout out to Fab Filter. And oh, if you guys are listening, I hope you hear it. And, and then and also, feel good about it. also the Stephen Slate, the, which I mentioned earlier, the 1073. It, it that that whole overlapping mid bands is amazing. That you can have that kind of processing power on something that sounds so good. <laughs> like, yeah, it wasn't even on the original, and still get that great air on the top end when you need it. Yeah. That's a, it's great. Beautiful plug in. Stephen Slate's amazing. Now, Slate has the virtual. And, and he, I don't endorse him. Okay. That's all right. I know that they make, uh, with for all their plugins now, you know, in this past year or whatever, they switched over to the virtual mix rack, which allows you to load up a whole series of plugins right. into I use a the single virtual slot. Mi- mix rack. Do you find that there are some benefits to that um, versus um, do you ever wish for the old way of putting an individual plugin on each slot in your DAW? I still do that. I'll, I'll, I'll have the virtual mix rack and I'll have his stuff. And then I'll still use Saturn and I'll use waves on, on the individual, uh, you know, channel. So, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a combination of both. Right. And then if you ever wanted to insert something between two of the slate plugins, you just put a mix rack on, on plug yes. in slot one and exactly. three and exactly. put your other plugin That's what on I would two. do. Yeah, for All sure. Right, very cool. So now how about a, a resource or, you know, any advice for the business side of doing this? Obviously, if somebody's recording just for a hobby, they may not care about this so much. Yeah. But if we want to build a career doing this, or even if we want to just make our career better doing this, what, what have you got for us? I mean, I just use a program called Invoice Pro for invoicing, and there's probably better things out there. Um, I'm always looking for something better, so if anybody has something better, let me know. If you can get to the point where you can afford one, hire an accountant <laughs> to do your book work, uh, ultimately, or find a uh, someone who wants to work with you as an assistant or something that has uh, knows something about accounting, mo- skills. accounting skills, have a, a good account- accounting skills. One, one bit of advice is uh, as you grow... And as you get older, your health becomes uh, an important factor. And just make sure that you're covered correctly with your health insurance. Because as you grow with your family and you know your wife and your family, uh, it, it can become a huge burden. And don't be don't don't feel safe that you have some five thousand dollar deductible eighty twenty health insurance program because if someone has a stroke or someone you have a possible heart attack, uh, one trip to the hospital can cost you $50,000 to $100,000. And that 20% gets really high really fast. You can be $20,000 in debt really quick. So I don't know what the answer is other than pay uh, higher health insurance premiums. Right. It's worth, unfortunately, it's worth putting your money into that so that you don't get stuck with a large percentage of something that might be much larger than you ever imagined. Yeah, and it, oh, I it, mean, sorry, a large percentage, even a small percentage yeah. of something that's much larger than you ever imagined might be overwhelming. Exactly. All right, good advice. And, uh, you know, a lot of you rock stars are here in the U.S. and and also you're at all over the world. So everybody's going to be dealing with different health insurance options. But I guess the takeaway is just take the time to look closely at it 
think about what would this mean to me in a real world situation where something very expensive happened one day and how would that affect me and, and try and protect yourself accordingly. I'm actually going through that right now, as I was mentioning to you, right now I'm actually going through the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University course, which is very educational to me as far as um, getting out of debt, savings, insurance, um, and then building up you know, wealth so that you can have something to retire on. You and know? one of the best advices he makes, I and I, believe, I haven't listened to him in a long time, was is to tr- try to figure out how to put away three to six months of your salary that you expect or your your expenses for three to six months so that you can survive the slow times in, what, in this business. Yeah. I, I, is that what he still teaches? He does indeed. Yeah. And the, as he calls it the emergency fund. So, exactly. You know, hopefully the slow times, ideally we aren't considering emergencies. We're sort of uh, anticipating them <laughs> yeah, right. and just sort of preparing for those as well. But that's for the real emergencies. But it's right? true. You know, this when you're doing music production, recording studio engineering mixing yourself you got to be prepared for what can be a real roller coaster ride and the important thing is how do you hang on when you're in the dip so great advice now how about uh, organizational resource or tool is there, are there some things that you use online that help you just kind of keep your life and, and business organized pretty much just using like that invoicing program and then interfacing with my bank I mean I really don't have a a great system. Do you, are you in email as often as the rest oh, of the modern yeah, yeah, world? Yeah, sure. Is that what you're talking about? Anything? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, oh yeah. We're all dealing with computers and phones yeah. and trying to communicate well, with I mean, the world these I think, days. I think I live my life on my iPhone. You know, for sure. Everything's integrated. Calendar, email, Facebook. You know, your social media. Everything is integrated. You're constantly uh, checking in with people, and of course, with clients, they always wanted for you to be immediately available. So. Uh, you're constantly being text messaged from your clients yeah. and or email. And I'm constantly checking email. And when working with a client on a day-to-day basis, most of the time when you're doing revisions on mixes and things, you're doing it in email. But sometimes a client or yourself may not even notice that you just sent an email. Maybe you know they may have not checked in the last couple hours. And usually if uh, I notice that I haven't gotten a response, then I text them. And usually you'll get an immediate response like, oh, I didn't look, I haven't looked lately. I've been doing a tracking session or whatever, you know. So, right, because you're in the so, middle of a mix. You're yeah, waiting for their response. Exactly. So can and they're, they could be doing something else, you know. So it's always about this immediacy. And unfortunately, we have the technology. In, in the day, we didn't have that technology. I remember, you know, 20 years ago, well, you had the technology where you just turn around behind you in the control room and you say, is that better or worse? Yeah, yeah. No, but even as far as uh, I, I would get calls from a producer and they'd say, hey, are you doing anything next week? We've got this five-day mix. Are you off? Yeah. Can you get a studio? Well, the only way to get a studio was to pick up a phone and call. And so when you called the studio, if they didn't answer, you called the next studio. And people lost business because you would go through the list, you know, because you had five or six places that you wanted to mix at or more, but you just started at your favorite and worked your way through and people didn't answer. But today there's really no excuse for it. You should, unless you don't want to work with the client, then you can just avoid their phone call. Yeah. But generally speaking, back in the day, if you missed that phone call and it went that way for you as well, we had pagers. Can you imagine? We were like yeah. doctors. We had pagers. And as soon as you got a page, you made sure you picked up unless it was somebody you didn't want to work with. Doctors and drug dealers. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> but uh, it was hard to uh, stay in touch with people back then and and have that immediacy. And studios would lose business because they they didn't answer the phone or the studio manager isn't here. Well, then you lose the business. I'm yeah. going to the next studio. So answer your emails, rock stars. I exactly. Guess that's the Always answer. answer your emails. But don't especially let your emails you first... be your master. Be the master of your emails. Absolutely. That's my advice. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. So now how about um, this hypothetical question, but imagine you had to start all over again. And um, let's say you were going to focus on mixing, which you're very knowledgeable about. Um, what would you do for a simple setup to record and mix with? How would you find people to to work with and mix? And how would you make ends meet to start out while you were building your business? Well, if I was had to start in a new place and I wanted to do both track and mix, I probably, it's not that hard these days. I mean, if you, if you have, I have a UAD Apollo, you know, if I um, interface that with my laptop and I've got my Neves and my Summits and a setup for recording with Pro Tools, 
I can record 16 tracks real easily and and track a band if I had to. As far as finding clients, I mean, I'm in a situation where I could go someplace. It doesn't matter really that much where I live. I would still get clients. But if I was starting over and no one knew who I was, then I would have to work the whole social media thing from scratch again. That's hard to imagine for me right now. Well, you have some young guys working with you as assistants. What do you see them doing as far as building up their network? And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that they potentially aspire to be a mixer like yourself, well, and, and that's where they're headed. Yeah, as long as I've been doing it, many of my assistants have gone on to be mix engineers, and uh, they always steal my clients. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but they, no, they, they, they gradually build up credit as an assistant engineer, and then they start mixing on their own, and... From one artist, they'll spin off into other artists, just like we all do. I'll give artists to guys that I've started with me, you know, that were assistants. If I can't do it, the session, then I'll say, hey, why don't you take this client and go with it? That's your client. Move on. And if you can get more clients from that, go ahead, you know? Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do when I have the opportunity to offer work to an intern, for example, you know, give them, connect them with somebody who needs help with them. I know it's a good fit and it's their first, one of their first paid gigs. Makes me feel great. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, So now here's the final question, closing one. Now um, we have the way back machine. We got a time machine here, the studio time machine, and you're able to go back and give yourself advice. So my question to you is if you could go back, what would you tell yourself? Young Yash is the single most important thing to becoming a rock star of the recording studio? The most important thing is to have a great attitude right from the start. You know, I was fortunate enough to have guys teach me that right off the bat. I was lucky enough to have myself tell me, not me, but other guys that were older tell you that right off the bat, to have a great attitude and to have fun with it, but take what you're doing seriously, but not too seriously. One thing you always have to remember when you're in the studio is you're not out there trying to solve the problems in the Middle East. You're making a record. You're not flying a 747. And if you make a mistake, it crashes and you die. The worst thing that could happen in the day was you erase the vocal and you could survive that, you know, with a little humility. Hopefully at the end of the day, we just make the best music to inspire people to be happy and more civil. If everyone on a session has a bad attitude, it ends up showing up in the music. If everyone has a great attitude, you're going to make a great record. And that's a good thing if we make that's a great, great, man. great record. What what a great advice to go out on. Yash, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars, man. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you. You know, I wish you had brought your good attitude to this interview. No, I'm just joking. I know. I'll try next time. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Let our listeners know how they can find you. As uh, I know that you take great pleasure in working with and developing new artists. And, um, it, you know, maybe there are people out there who are interested in in uh, getting their records mixed. I don't know, but how can people follow you, learn more about you and see your studio and your work? Well, since my name is so unusual and it's spelled J-A-S-Z-C-Z, that's pronounced Yash, you can just go to the Yash Man, T-H-E-Y-O-S-H-M-A-N.com. Uh, <laughs> so the Yashman.com is is an easy way to find me or Yash Brothers, uh, Yash Bros, just Yash, B-R-O-S. You can find me that way. Groovy. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Again, it was a pleasure hanging out with you and uh, I look forward to seeing more of you around the studio. Same here. All right, dude. Cheers. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.